one territory by people from another territory, and the dominating territory changes the social structure, government, and economics of the colonized territory. This colonization usually occurred to increase profits or economic gains through exploitation to expand power, through land appropriation, or to expand religious domains, while dehumanizing and subjugating indigenous people, slaves, or indentured laborers. Alongside the political, economic, and cultural domination, there exists a, a discursive domination that positions the colonizer as intellectually and culturally superior to the colonized. The colonial agenda within psychiatry has been exposed for enforcing its social, cultural, and political goals based in white Eurocentric heteronormative male ableist neoliberalism. The Western methods of creating taxonomies produce disciplines such as psychiatry and social work that privilege the white Western male colonialist norm and organizes the knowledge produced to silence and exclude the history and or voice and knowledge of the oppressed. Colonial Western psychiatry has been described as a vehicle used to advance colonial nation building and the very definition of civil society by authorizing the definition of, of what we consider civilized, the civilized sort of respectable subject. Canada's early asylum and colonial administrators were often one and the same and communicated with other asylum and colonial administrators both at home and abroad in the United States and in the UK and other parts of Western Europe fairly regularly in the effort to share information on how to run asylum efficiently as part of worldwide colonial projects. The Wilded School was one of uh, British Columbia's first segregated total residential institutions for people with developmental disabilities. The colonization and segregation of First Nations people in residential schools involved du judges, doctors, and psychiatrists confining those deemed as medically or psychiatrically unfit, whether First Nations or not, to asylums and hospitals. <clears throat> Some First Nations people in Alberta and British Columbia, as well as parts of the United States, were psychiatrically reported to an asylum uh, exclusively used to warehouse Native Americans or First Nations at the Hiawatha Indian in Asylum in uh, Canton, South Dakota. The sovereign power of the colonial state was always predicated on the violent subjugation of indigenous people, slaves, or indentured laborers, as violence was integral to colonialism. In order to, to process the legacy of colonial operations, Within the dominant discourses in forensic mental health, that which is predominantly interested in biomedical explanations and causes and interventions for mental illness, it's important to review some, <clears throat> some key perspectives on, on truth and power and discourse, as, uh, as I'll talk about um, in relation to Michelle Foucault and Edward Said. According to Foucault, truth is the ensemble of rules according to which the true and false are separated, into which specific effects of power attach to the truth. Truth can never be separated from power, and we must always question the objectivity of accepted truths. The dominant regime of truth within, mental, within the mental health system today is the objectivity of biomedical psychiatry. The authority over what is considered impartial or objective knowledge is dominated by the disciplines of psychology, medicine, psychiatry, and social work, and advanced through their technologies of discourse. The, this discursive dominance is evident in the Mental Health Act in the UK and Canada that embed the language of biomedical psychiatry and the authority of biomedical disciplines within the mechanisms of power in the mental health system. The Mental Health Act has given psychiatrists, by what we call forms or section, the authority to forcibly command police to apprehend a person and force assessment, confinement, and treatment. 
Discourse, according to Foucault, describes the particular kind of language to which specialized knowledge has to conform in order to be regarded as true. Discourse actually produces the object even as we describe it. Knowledge, then, is in the dominant regime of truth in the mental health system, has to conform to its own paradigm in order to be recognized as legitimate. So the language of illness and disorder, symptoms, risk, and diagnoses must be adhered to in order to be accepted as valid. Edward Said demonstrated in, in, in Orientalism how Orientalist discourse justified an advanced colonial rule through Western academic knowledge and a will to power to govern the Orient. Uh, according to Said's concept of Orientalist discourse, there were a number of productive outcomes that have forced themselves into the practices of academic disciplines and claimed objectivity during colonial projects. Individuals in the Orient were subordinated into a general type through Orientalist discourse and posed through consistent binaries that set Europe apart from the Orient. This was done geographically, racially, religiously. This Orientalist discursive regime also produced an ontological and epistemological difference between the European us and the Oriental them. The Orient becomes this static and changing thing, and authors on the subject draw clear distinctions between themselves, who were white, male, European, etc., and the Oriental. The Orientalist also produces this overarching sense of contempt for the other and becomes the other expert who knows the Oriental better than the Oriental can know his or herself. Orientalism structures and guides academic fields and allows for a tendency to define the other in broad sweeping terms, eliminating the need to subdefine or for any heterogeneity within groups. Timothy Mitchell also demonstrates how the rule of expertise developed from the 19th century European understandings of the world, how the study of society became a university profession that was divided into separate social science disciplines that disembedded academic fields from society and divorced fields from their initial projects, which were often imperial and colonial projects. Mitchell outlines how the field of economics itself was founded upon the writings of contributors such as John Maynard Keynes, who wrote his first book while employed at the India office in London, the successor to the East India Company, the corporate colonizing power in which James Mill, Robert Malthus, and John Stuart Mill, three leading figures in 19th century political economy, all held very senior positions. Mitchell uses the example of economics to demonstrate how certain forms of social exchange, contract law, corporate powers, including methods of calculation, the way we organize information, and government regulations that were formalized in Western Europe in the 19th century as market exchange were abstracted by economics into a framework of social science. The mental health system follows a similar genealogy that developed during colonization, produced laws, methods of calculation, and government regulations that separate notions of mental health and the disciplinary powers that control the mental health system from the historical civilizing colonial projects of which they were a part. From Saeed, Foucault, and Mitchell, we can begin to consider how certain regimes of truth gave the genuine mental health systems by producing the object to create the mentally ill through the operations of discourse that separate notions of health from mental health and privilege authorized texts such as the DSM, disciplines such as psychiatry and social work and professions and by controlling those that appear manifestly different through the rule of expertise. In today's mental health system, aspects of human experience and behavior are categorized as symptoms of a biomedical illness and attached to the accepted truth that these symptoms represent a disease that must be treated with a biomedical intervention rather than 
a social or political transformation is upon this foundation of belief that all mental diseases and disorders reside in the individual, that we can dismiss any consideration of the influence and impacts of the social and political precursors or, or context surrounding any sort of illness or suffering. The past research on racialized minorities diagnosed with mental health issues has also been directed toward creating the ideal situation for biomedical treatment to occur. At times, considering the contemporary social and political context relevant to this project by highlighting social inequities. While these ideal conditions for biomedical intervention are not realized, violence becomes justified within the regime of truth as no other alternatives can attach to the truth. This production of knowledge that produces these homogeneous categories defined by and only diagnosable by the controlling disciplines maintains the erasure of broader political and social context in any representation of a person and orders historical and, and patient knowledge as inferior. These technologies and practices advance through the dehumanizing violent practices of colonization that position certain bodies as superior to the other, white, male, able-bodied, able-minded, heterosexual, Christian, European, etc. In order to extend this exploration, the question of how the system maintains dominance in mental health, I also looked at the role of internal inquiry and the erasure of voices of racialized people that are most with mental illness that supports this sort of dominance. Radhika Mamangia has demonstrated how uh, the internal inquiry emerged as a key apparatus for the production of a regime, regime of truth governed by the liberal notion of impartiality. Mamangia describes uh, a detailed analysis of many colonial inquiries into the 19th century transportation of indentured laborers from India. The first ships carrying 437 laborers to British Guyana from Calcutta arrived with only farm year 19. And regardless of their stance on the issue, the results of the internal inquiry produced a familiar outcome. The Law Commission in India efficiently and speedily considered the matter to conclude that no alterations were necessary to the prevailing system. Mangi describes how the inquiry serves as both, both as a process of evaluation and adjudication, as a method of information collection and complication that actually forms a dispersive field that defines the parameters of the debate and also acts to shore up this notion of impartial truth that enables regimes of truth to continue to dominate. It decides who's at the table for the discussion. The findings of an inquiry were and only are held in question if they do not resemble the kind of truth that is accepted by the dominant regime of truth, that of objectivity. The inquiry produces or reproduces a regime of truth based on, a, on an ensemble of rules defined by impartiality and objectivity and form a discursive field or by inquiries that produces also the very object of consideration. These practices and methods of inquiry gain momentum during colonization and have many effects today. Within Mangia's analysis, along with Said and Foucault and Mitchell, we include the operation of internal inquiry to our considerations of how certain regimes of truth gain privilege and hegemony in mental health systems by producing an object, the mentally ill, through the operations of discourse and the formation of disciplines, including psychiatry and social work, and professions aimed at controlling those that appear to be the different through the rule of expertise. Other authors have demonstrated how colonial discursive practices have resulted in the elimination of the voice of certain groups. Latamani and Gayatri Spivak have both written on the historiography of women in the context. 
of causation through the example of any little self-immolation. Without attempting to get into all of that and track their evidence here, I need them to highlight their examples of how this specific history in the context of colonization was written by the British Empire through the privileging of the masculine Hindu elite and their interpretations of religious doctrine within a Eurocentric episteme that has written the voices of subaltern groups, in this case I'm talking about Hindu widows, out of history. So while women remain the ground upon which these debates on tradition and histories are articulated, uh, they are neither considered the subject or object of the discourse. The concept of sati, Hindu women's self mutilation is thereby forged without women as a subject or object of the discourse. In the mental health system, we can see similar practices that privilege the elite voices of psychiatrists, lawyers, and expert opinions, leaving the voices of racialized minorities diagnosed with mental health issues, 